May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I look at the examples of William Wilberforce and Anthony Ashley Coker, who was the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, brought together for two reasons. One, because they were passionately committed Christians who wrestled with the call to ordination, but finally heard from God that the best place that they could serve was not among the ordained, but for them within the realm of politics, and used their political activity tirelessly, uh, facing continual rejection. I think the story is, is that Wilberforce introduced an anti-slavery bill for almost 20 years, year after year after year, and it was finally passed after, right after he died, uh, to literally create huge changes in the life of England and as a result in the life of the wider world. What does that ask of me to hear their stories and to think about what they did? it actually invites me to live in a way that is faced this way. To literally be opened up, to be turned inside out is not too strong a phrase. So that the focus of my life is really not what's going on in me. But the focus is, how may I serve? And that becomes the directive that orients, focuses, and even preoccupies my time. The echo is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who among other things described Jesus as a man for others. And I think that's an apt description of what it means to be a Christian. If the Christian understands the freedom of what we've received in Jesus, this is what takes us right to the Galatian reading, because Paul is creating a distinction, a, a kind of contrast, on the one, those who live under the disciplinarian, is the word he describes, of being under the law. Well, what's that like? That means I'm always facing this accuser who is showing me what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. Well, if you live under the shadow of that accusation, no matter what name you give to it, whether that be God or whether that be a parent or any person in some kind of an authority, it automatically invites a level of preoccupation. How am I doing? How am I doing in comparison to somebody else? What's really going on inside of me that other people don't know about? I mean, the entire focus of living under that kind of disciplinarian view, especially if it's of God, but certainly if it's under some kind of an authority, is that I can't live inside out with a focus of, on other people. <laughs> it's not possible. We only have so much energy. And usually a person in that position has almost his or her energy focused on how well I am or am not doing. This sort of interior competition that drives just about everything I do. Can't even, I mean, I, I noticed it when I lived in New York City, but this, it's also for here. Because when you live in New York, you live under such sort of crowded circumstances. When you walk down the street, if you notice, everybody walks like this, just like that. They, they don't see other people on the sidewalk. And if they're looking up, it's only to make sure where they're going. It's not because they actually have any concern about the people around them at all. I, I felt like, okay, one of the most revolutionary things I could do as a New Yorker is actually to say hello to people. And I did. I had a wrap where I walked my dog early in the morning, and they're always dog walkers. And you see them, they're the same group every day. And so I started saying hello to the people. I mean, we lived in the same neighborhood. Um, it was amazing the reactions I got to that. Well, actually, the same thing is true in Orlando, only it's our car as opposed to the sidewalk. That's our insulation. That's the focus of our destination. That's our preoccupation that's reinforced by what we're playing on the radio or listening to as we make our way from one destination. It still creates its own dynamic. It, it's like what happened in the lives of the, of the South, especially Southern towns, when air conditioning 
was invented and the front porch <laughs> went away. And people didn't talk to each other in the same way they used to. We really do live in a culture, regardless of whether we're talking about the Northeast or the South, that is oriented around a self-focused life. And more often than not, no matter what name you give to that disciplinary, even if it's culture, it still invites the same kind of interior preoccupation. But to live clothed with Christ, which is what Paul describes we who are baptized, has a different orientation and point of view. Because if I'm clothed with Christ, I'm complete. No matter how I feel. I'm actually complete. I'm free. I'm secure in my eternal destination. I know that I belong to God and that there is no disciplinary and up in the sky, but rather who, not what, who is up there is someone who is literally, organically joined to me and me to him. What can separate us from the love of Christ? The rhetorical answer to that question is nothing. That gives me actually a completely different view of who I am and who I am in the world. And that means I'm actually free to notice. I'm free to pay attention to who and what is actually going on around me. Not in an act of self-protection. Oh, did you hear about the accident this morning on the highway? I need to be sure I need to go there. And you can't be too careful when you're on I-40. Especially with, I mean, that, all of that is the language of self-protection and self-preoccupation. Freedom to be one who is clothed with Christ is not to throw caution to the wind, but it's actually to have an orientation to service. You'll never notice the little one who needs the cup of water, to quote the gospel if you're always preoccupied about how you're doing inside. It's just, it's not possible. Which is why Boniface's description of Christ as a man for others, the description, the story of the Lord of Shaftesbury, Wilberforce, and their tireless orientation toward those that God saw Worthy and showed them. And therefore, we're invited to the same position in Christ, and as a result, the same possibility of seeing. Because if we belong to Jesus, that is never an invitation merely to self security, it's actually an invitation to pay attention, to notice. And wondering where God might send you and what you might see as you go. And how that might actually even result in a call from God on your life, regardless of whether you're wearing one of these or not. One story close. When I was in Philadelphia, a woman on my staff came to me incredibly troubled in a staff meeting. And the story was, was she had read in the paper that morning about what had happened when the forces came in and Ceausescu's regime was toppled. It was a kind of people revolution. And one of the things that was discovered were these warehouses filled with children with AIDS, something that Romania had always officially denied. And she said, I can't get it. And the word of wisdom that was spoken was, well, maybe God's asking you to think about doing something about it. Out of that came a holy 501c3, long story short, called Aiding Romania's Children, which raised money to send doctors, physicians, and child care workers to go over to connect with the local Romanians and to actually begin to see those warehouses of orphans actually become places of healing. One lone female on the staff of a church in suburban Philadelphia. 
You see, if you really understand that you are clothed with Christ, you're not afraid to step into the breach thinking where God might take you because you can rely on his supply in the going. And that since God loves the whole world, it changes how you think about the world as well as how you think about yourself. And therefore, out of that, the call to pay attention in the end because it becomes an invitation from God to say yes to wherever God will take you. Because those are the people that know very deeply God's love for his world. Like Wilberforce. Amen. Mm -hmm.